start this video out with an interesting document, number 181150 in the Supreme Court of the United States, Georgia et al. Petitioners versus Public Resource Org Incorporated. That's .org. And it's a, this document is on writ of Certiorari to the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit for the International Code Council Incorporated and the American Gas Association as Amichi Kure supporting petitioners. Now, in their table of authorities, there are some interesting parts to note. One would be the American uh, Society, I believe that's what that stands for, for testing and materials versus publicresource.org incorporated, as well as the building officials and code administrators versus code tech incorporated. Those and uh, these others are obviously also very pertinent, but those two uh, name wise are interesting to note. Then we have the constitutional provisions of which only two amendments are actually noted here. That's number five and number 14. <clears throat> now, number 14 is not, it doesn't have any standing because <clears throat> it is counteracted by previous uh, articles and amendments, but it's cited here anyway. <clears throat> and the US Constitution Article 1, Subsection 8, Clause 8, and then Article six clause two and then there's usc statutes that are ironically quoted in this document and we will see why that's a little bit strange later next we have the continuation of a table of authorities which includes the oxford english dictionary the online edition from 2019 if you notice that at the bottom now i would never consider that an authority but this document is. And of course, they are in line with the Occupational Safety and Health Standards, Federal Regulation 23502, which is interesting that that's on the same level as the Oxford English Dictionary. And there's also the National Research Council Standards, Conformity Assessment and Trade into the 21st Century from a .edu website there. So those are authorities, apparently. Now, let's begin. Quote, Interest of Amici Ture, International Code Council Incorporated, ICC, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the development of model codes and standards. Most U.S. communities and many global jurisdictions depend on ICC's International Codes, also known as the I-Codes. The I-Codes are a set of coordinated building safety and fire prevention codes. They benefit public safety, providing minimum safeguards for people at home, at school, and in the workplace, and they support industries' need for a single standardized set of codes without regional variations. So in that first paragraph, they make the de declaration that there is an industry need for a single standardized set of codes and there being no regional variations. So therefore, according to this writer in the first paragraph, there's a need for centralization, with obviously them being the centralizing component. Of course, also in the first line or sentence, I don't think that could have been written any better by the likes of John D. Rockefeller, uh, Margaret Sanger, or possibly even Mengel, if many are aware of that name. Considering the wording sounds like it came off of the page of a eugenics article where it talks about so-called, quote, model codes and standards. Sounds a lot like the model family that eugenicists like to talk about. I'll get to that later in this video. Anyway, 50 states and the District of Columbia have adopted the IC codes at the state or jurisdictional 
level. State or jurisdictional level. There's an interesting note there. Federal agencies use the I codes as well, including the architect of the Capitol, General Services Administration, National Park Service, Department of State, U.S. Forest Service, and the Veterans Administration. The Department of Defense refers to the International Building Code for constructing military facilities. Well, isn't that nice? Guess it would be difficult to find the uh, schematics for military facilities then if they're going to one specific place for them. Also doesn't sound like they have their own developed building code then if they're using an international one. Anyway, including those that house U.S. troops around the world and at home. That's concerning. Amtrak uses the International Green Construction Code for new and extensively renovated sites and structures. Uh, note one, which is from Model Codes and Standards, that really eugenicist sounding line there. No counsel for a party authored this brief in whole or in part. No such counsel nor any party made a monetary contribution intended to fund the preparation or submission of the brief, and no person or entity other than the amici curiae, their members, or their counsel made such a monetary contribution. Monetary. Well, that disclosure means virtually nothing because there's all kinds of ways that you can um, provide a conf contribution that's not monetary, right? All kinds of ways that you can lie without lying, apparently, which in the end just ends up being lying on anyway, honestly. In continuation, ICC publishes a new version of each I-code every three years. These revisions may reflect changes in technology for best practices or may expand and improve the revised I-code to make it more effective. Producing the I-code costs millions of dollars each year. Among other things, ICC must pay for the salaries and benefits of their administration expert staffs, office space, and meeting facilities. Information technology that allows for online participation in the development process, outreach, and education efforts, and the costs of publication to recover a portion of its costs, ICC relies heavily on revenues earned from the sale or licensing of the I-codes, which amounts account which amounts account for a significant portion of ICC's total revenue each year. All right, so from that paragraph, we get that they have other forms of revenue because it's a significant but not the entire portion of ICC's total revenue, and that that comes from the sale or licensing of international codes, which, as stated in the previous portion, have been adopted by state or jurisdictional interests and the federal and among many other agencies as well, which are separately listed, apart from all 50 states and the District of Columbia, meaning basically everywhere. So that doesn't seem like it might be uh, suspicious at all. Although ICC permits internet users to view iCodes in read-only form on ICC's website for free, ICC depends on copyrights to sustain its ability to sell and license the iCodes. Despite ICC's registered copyrights in the iCodes, however, several entities, including respondent in the case, have reproduced simple or have reproduced complete versions of copyrighted iCodes on their website. Currently, ICC is pursuing a copyright infringement action against Upcodes Inc., International Code Council Inc. versus Upcodes Inc. Number 117 CV 6261, Southern District of New York. What a surprise that they are doing it there. Might as well be the Northern District of California, where we see a lot of these phony court cases going on today. Of course, the Southern District of New York would be famous today for a certain case that was intentionally, shall we say, mishandled about a certain uh, Jeffrey individual. Anyway, Upcodes is a for-profit startup whose business model centers on allowing website users to copy, print, save, distribute, and manipulate iCodes without restriction. In addition to selling premium access, which offers additional features like bookmarking, advanced searching, and project collaboration capabilities, Upcodes has given the world free access to unauthorized copies of ICC's works, arguing that the works incorporation into the laws of various jurisdictions destroys their federal copyright. ICC accordingly has a profound interest in the outcome of this case. 
While the question on which Certiorari was granted is narrow, whether the government edicts doctrine makes state-authored works that lack the force of law uncopyrightable. Respondent's brief in opposition suggests that respondent may press the court for a much broader ruling that extends beyond the state-authored works in this case. Were the court to issue a broad ruling in respondent's favor by extending the holding of Banks v. Manchester, 128 U.S. 244-1888, to privately authored works, the result would be devastating to ICC and many other standards development organizations. And it would compromise their nonprofit mission of promoting safety and protecting the public upon which many governmental entities depend. Yeah, that sounds like safe and effective to me. The American Gas Association, AGA, founded in 1918, well, that's an auspicious year, if you're not familiar with the works of the uh, reorganization of secondary education and those cardinal principles. I did uh, other videos on that. <clears throat> anyway, represents more than 200 local energy companies that deliver clean natural gas throughout the United States. There are more than 74 million residential, commercial, and industrial natural gas customers in the U.S., of which 95%, more than 71 million customers, receive their gas from AGA members. AGA is an advocate for natural gas utility companies and their customers and provides a broad range of programs and services for member natural gas pipelines, marketers, gatherers, international natural gas companies, and industry associates. Today... Natural gas meets more than one-fourth of the United States' energy needs. AGA's activities include research and analysis on end-use gas technical issues for the mutual benefit of the gas utility industry and its customers. And, of course, those customers would not be you or I. They would be the municipal works that we are all forced to adhere to based on, surprise, surprise, building codes. And zoning codes and all that stuff, which these people develop. Anyway, research supporting natural gas and end, gas end use codes and standards has played a vital role in maintaining the market viability of natural gas in residential and commercial applications and expanding end use of natural gas. Yeah, go figure. That's called a monopoly, forcing people to use a certain product uh, with the threat of force, actually. So it's, it's a little bit more than just a monopoly. Anyway. And <clears throat> contributes to the safe and economical use of natural gas. Based on its experience with natural gas and end use codes and standards, AGA is concerned about judicial interpretations of copyright law that could impair the mission of standards development organizations. Well, isn't that interesting? I'm sure they don't mind the judicial interpretations of copyright law that don't impair the missions of standards development organizations. Anyway, uh, continuing, summary of argument. Despite the breadth of respondents and the 11th Circuit's assertions that copyright deprivation, this case represents an uncommon and representative set of act, facts. That word deprivation there is definitely a quote from the Constitution. So that's interesting. Here, at least according to the 11th Circuit, the works are authored by a state and the copyrights are claimed by a state. Most other related cases involve a private author, which is one copyright holder. That more typical scenario can raise two constitutional issues that do not arise here. The Supremacy Clause bars state and local governments from defeating rights created by federal law, and the Takings Clause bars governments from expropriating private property without just compensation. Now, notice what they're doing here is they're using jargon to quote sections of the Constitution without actually directly referencing them because they're pulling them out of context. There is no supremacy clause of the Constitution. There is an article in the Constitution that states it's the supreme law of the land. Calling it a supremacy clause is diminishing it. So it sounds like some sort of simple contract thing. <clears throat> And the Supremacy Clause, so-called, does not actually bar state and local governments from defeating rights created by federal law. It simply states that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land 
and it doesn't directly do any of the things listed here, those would be other sections of the Constitution that do it. So what this person's insinuating is that without the, quote, supremacy clause, then it couldn't bar state and local governments from blah, 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 because it wouldn't be the supreme law and all that. It's quite ridiculous. Anyway, the takings clause, I have no idea what they're talking about there, because that could apply to many clauses in the Constitution. So that that's uh, convoluted on purpose by the individual that doesn't want to clarify their points in this document because they're lying and they're also trying to obfuscate and say things which you or I might think they're saying something different like their overt declaration that they're involved in the possibly the most corrupt monopolistic system that anyone in history has ever seen anyway <clears throat> If all law and sufficiently law-like material is in the public domain, as respondent and the decision below maintain, incorporating privately authored works into law infringes both constitutional provisions, but the lower courts have barely begun to address these issues, and the lower courts in this case did not address them at all. Consistent with its usual practice, this court should not express or imply a position on either issue. The court thus should reject the sweeping claims made by Respondent and the 11th Circuit, which have implications far beyond the governmental author and copyright holder in this case. The court should also reverse the judgment below. The 11th Circuit drew from this court's 19th century case law, which construed a completely different copyright statute than the one that governs today. A broad non-statutory doctrine prohibiting copyrights for all government edicts. But this court's case, cases, do not stand for such a broad doctrine. On the contrary, they stress the importance of hewing to the precise terms of Congress's statutes. Although the court has traditionally excluded judicial work product from copyright based on self-imposed policy representing the judiciary's consensus, it has never denied copyright protection for any other category of government edicts. Isn't that interesting? See, this person is, is <laughs> they're, 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 they're kind of making underhanded remarks at the court itself, stating that while the court uh, reserves what, what I've seen in other documents referenced as judicial immunity, where they can basically do whatever the hell they want and get away with it because they're the ones that administer law, right? Well, that's basically what this person's saying in a rather underhanded way, but at the same time, they're attempting to present themselves as being on the court's position. So it's sort of a, seems like it's like a kind of a veiled insult. But it is so convoluted that I don't even think anybody in the court would even notice that section right there at the bottom, especially considering the lavish praise for the court's um, stress of hewing to the precise terms of Congress's statutes, right? That's that's a just overly flirtatious flattery of a flamboyant and inflammatory nature. <laughs> anyway, meanwhile, Congress has given every indication that the so-called government edicts doctrine narrowly limited. For example, the copyright statute excludes only works created by federal officials in their official capacities. <laughs> Ironically referencing the code here, 17 USC subsection 101105. And it expressly rejects the notion that individual copyright owners' property rights may be eliminated through government action. 17 USC subsection 201E. Courts may not expand on these provisions based on their own policy preferences by holding that other categories of law-like works are uncopyrightable or that governmental incorporation of privately authored works takes away their copyrights. Along with the executive branch, Congress has long supported incorporating privately authored works into law. If any trade-off needs to be made between that pro-incorporation policy and copyright law, Congress is the appropriate branch of government to make it. Well, that's partially true. 
if we had a legitimate Congress, they would be the appropriate branch of the constitutionally uh, mandated entity to, well, actually, no, they wouldn't because the uh, Constitution actually already addresses that. It's just this individual or individuals that wrote this thing did not address the actual applicable sections in the Constitution. Instead, they are insinuating them. Because what they're talking about there is that section in the Constitution that states that Congress, and only Congress, no one else, can't delegate it, can't, it, nobody else can do it, has to ensure a limited time of protection to writers and inventors, specifically. So that's what they're referencing, but they did not actually directly reference it in the document. They're subversively referencing it because they know what's going on and they know they're talking to uh, other, shall we say, compatriots, same type of system. Anyway, argument. When the court should limits, limit its focus to state author works to avoid complex and weighty constitutional questions. And there you go. That's the reason why they are attempting to obfuscate in this in this letter right here because they want to avoid complex and weighty constitutional questions because when people start questioning it well the whole thing falls apart and so that's what they want to avoid the unusual facts of this case obscure the constitutional difficulties <laughs> yeah difficulties that arise from respondents and the 11th Circuit's sweeping assertions about the uncopyrightability of the law. I'll say that 10 times fast. According to the court below, the annotations here were developed and copyrighted by the state of Georgia. Wasn't that interesting? The state of Georgia, allegedly a government entity, can copyright, apparently. Whatever that is, that's just really weird. In the 11th Circuit's words, they were created by Georgia's legislatures in the exercise of their legislative authority, and Georgia holds the copyright in the annotations in its own name. And they reference PET APP 4A6A. That... This fact pattern is atypical, as the discussion in the Certorari stage briefing shows, the legal issues in this area of the law arise most often in disputes about the copyrights on privately authored works that are later incorporated into law by government actors. Hmm, that's some interesting wording there. Government actors, they're acting as government, and they incorporate privately authored works into law later on. Could that be because they are not really lawful? Anyway, that's an interesting point there. And then we have the references to those interesting cases that I mentioned in the beginning, which of course is the uh, public publicresource.org versus uh, American Society for Testing Materials, or the other way around actually. And then the Vic V S Building Code Congress International Incorporated. And of course the others are would probably be interesting too. Oh, and then there's that building officials and code administrators versus code tech. Oh yeah, that is the, uh, the second one I mentioned in the beginning. Anyway, in its ongoing litigation against private standards developers, Respondent maintains that such privately authored works lose their previous copyright protection when incorporated into law. In respondent's view, incorporated by reference makes these works a part of the law, and the law can never be copyrighted. <laughs> There's a bunch of twisty wording going on right there. Similarly, in this court, respondent's broad, respondent broadly insists that the law belongs to the people without qualification based on whether the law was authored by the people's representatives or by private citizens. All right, there's a couple things to note here. First of all, the private citizens that this individual or individuals are talking about is likely the juridic private citizen because they never, ever, ever recognize the legitimacy of natural people, ever. And the people's representatives likely has to, because especially you look at the capitalized P on peoples, that probably also has to do with the juridic people. 
so that's the word game going on there because people has come to mean juridic people and not naturally born people or human beings and private citizens are juridic people which are lig registered or listed as private so that's what likely this author is referencing in and without the comma or semicolon stating excluding the natural born blah 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 because all of this is coded language and the quote there the law belongs to the people see talking about the part in the constitution where it talks about this particular subject and which naturally the individuals that wrote it would have intended naturally born people and hence the obfuscation by the courts about the juridic people coming about which you can find through analysis of tradition history and practice from historical documents and things like that but either way all of these individuals they never recognize the the natural born people or the section in the constitution that states that anything not prohibited or specifically given to the entities listed in the constitution are reserved by the states and people respectively well that's that whole debate over people and that's the whole obfuscation of people to mean juridic people anyway that's a digression which i've covered in other videos <clears throat> even petitioners accept that the law itself is not copyrightable PETBR2, hence the 11th Circuit broadly asserted below that it was clear and not contested that the law itself is intrinsically public domain material and therefore uncopyrightable, even when privately authored. Now, what law would that be? One has to wonder. That's another very convoluted piece of wording there. But when the law incorporates material from privately authored works, that claim is neither clear nor uncontested. There is no question that privately authored standards or model codes receive copyright protection from their creation as long as they meet the usual requirement. CEG VEEK 293F.3D at 800, acknowledging that model building codes, QA model building codes or QUA, are facially copyright protected. That interesting wording that this person or in or people <laughs> are using because valid copyrights undoubtedly exist before such works incorporation into law any claim that the works enter into the public domain when they become part of the law necessarily hinges on the notion that incorporation into law somehow invalidates the private author's copyright id 8806 higgin botham j dissenting if that were true, then any state or local government would have the power at any time to invalidate private actors' previously valid copyrights by incorporating their copyright works into its laws. And I'm sure that's exactly what they do. Anyway, the suggestion that state or local action can invalidate vested federal copyrights raises at least two serious constitutional concerns. As discussed next, Thus, such action would violate both the Supremacy Clause and the Takings Clause as incorporated through the 14th Amendment. Isn't that interesting wording there, right? They're stating that the Supremacy Clause, whatever that is, because they didn't reference the actual location of it, was incorporated through the 14th Amendment. Now, as far as I'm aware, there's only one Supremacy Clause, and it came way before the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment is not the one that gave that validity, but that's sort of what they're stating. At least they're stating that the Supremacy Clause was incorporated through the 14th Amendment, whatever that means. So that's, that, that is a intentionally confusing and partially vague statement that could be a lie, depending on what exactly the person is trying to say. Now, I believe I know what they're trying to say, and I'm sure most people would agree, especially today, maybe not in the past, but either way, it's just another example where they're being intentionally deceptive and dodgy, because what they're trying to say is definitely going to be not something that most people would like. 
In this case, of course, these constitutional issues are not presented. Here, the entity responsible for the annotation's legal effect, or lack thereof, is the same entity that developed and copyrighted them. Georgia has neither impaired a private actor's vested federal rights nor taken a private actor's property. Given the particular facts of this case and the dangers in issuing an overbroad ruling, the court should reject the sweeping assertions made by respondent in the court below and occasionally even petitioners, and it should steer well clear of any ruling that would carry negative implications for the rights of private copyright owners. Isn't that interesting, right? There's some coded wording there, more of the same, really. See E.G. Clinton v. Jones, 520 U.S. 681, 690, 1997. We have often stressed the importance of avoiding the premature adjudication of constitutional questions. Wonder why that would be. Spectre Motor Serve v. McClellan, 323 U.S. 101, 105, 1944. If there is one doctrine more deeply rooted than any other in the process of constitutional adjudication, it is that we ought not to pass on questions of constitutionality unless such adjudication is unavoidable. Wasn't that nice? As if they have the authority to do that. <laughs> Respondents' views contravene the Supremacy Clause. The Supremacy Clause makes federal law the supreme law of the land. And there you go. They are indeed referencing that one, which was not validated by the 14th Amendment. It was incorporated through the 14th Amendment. Well, that's a tricky way of stating what I said before, which is that the 14th Amendment is invalidated because it's contrary to other parts of the Constitution, just like the 13th Amendment and any that came after the 13th and 14th. Anyway, notwithstanding anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary. <laughs> That's a misquotation. And not to mention, that appears to be taking two parts of the Constitution and melding them together as though they were in the same part. And there they have the reference, U.S. Constitution Article 6, Clause 2. Actually, no, that, that might actually be in the right Constitution, because the other one states that nothing shall be construed, no, no part of the Constitution shall be construed to uh, counteract other parts or something like that. Anyway, now this person states federal supremacy means, among other things, that state and local governments may not curtail federal rights. And in that one paragraph, they change to a different entity because federal supremacy is not the same thing as constitutional supremacy. Because in the Constitution, it states that that document and all treaties lawfully made, obviously, under the document, they are the supreme law. Not the federal. The federal that we have is not the supreme law of anything. Practically speaking, they are through the force of arms and people's fear. But they're really not the supreme of anything. It's that document that's supposed to be anyway. It's the supreme law, according to the document. And that's what they're fraudulently pretending to be following. But it is directly stated federal supremacy and not constitutional supremacy. Because words do mean things. That includes federal intellectual property rights, copyright, and patent laws derived from Congress's express power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And here is referencing that part that I particularly talked about earlier in the document, you know, the parts that they don't really want anyone talking about. U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Subsection 8, Clause 8. Like any other valid exercise of Congress's legislative authority, the copyright and patent statutes are the supreme law of the land. Ha ha, there's some more obfuscation right there. Not to mention, you notice, supreme law is not capitalized. Neither is land. 
supreme law of the land in the constitution has supreme capitalized and land capitalized and they don't that is no accident in addition congress's legislative authority the copyright and patent statutes they're not the supreme law of the land because the congress that issued them was fraudulent and did a lot of things that were contrary to the constitution thus voiding nearly everything they did but as well the constitution is the supreme law of land and it states that congress shall ensure the protection which of course they don't and never have because the congress we have is fraudulent but it does not allow them to delegate and anything as according to other sections of the constitution they always love to ignore anything not stipulated in it is left to the states or the people respectively not the juridic people of course but that's how they present it anyway these people are all liars so when state law touches upon the area of these federal statutes, it is familiar doctrine that the federal policy may not be set at naught or its benefits denied by the state law. And there's that quotation there. This court has repeatedly held that states may not interfere with the rights and privileges established through Congress's intellectual property legislation. See Capital Cities Cape Link 3. Crisp 467 US 691 709 711 1984, holding that the Supremacy Clause preempts a state law interfering with the federally created right to obtain compulsory licenses for certain copyright works. Now, isn't that interesting? The Supremacy Clause, of which, of course, they're talking about a part in the Constitution that wasn't ever technically speaking listed as a clause, mind you, because that wording is not used in the Constitution clauses. Anyway, it preempts the state law, meaning comes before, which would interfere with federally created right to obtain compulsory licenses. So, the fraudulent federal not constitutional law creates a right for states to obtain compulsory meaning coerced licensing for copyrighted works of course it doesn't say which copyrighted works and it certainly doesn't state all copyrighted works so there's some interesting wording there Anyway, that's Sears 376 U.S. at 231-232, holding that the Supremacy Clause preempts state law impairment of the federal right to copy unpatentable articles. Sperry v. Florida, X. Rel. Florida Bar, 373 U.S. 379-404-1963, holding that the Supremacy Clause preempts a state law interfering with patent prosecutors' federal right to practice before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Well, there's some more interesting notes that would really peel back the veil of this corporate scheme that pretends to be the law, the Constitution, that is. Because all of the stuff that they're doing here is all pretending to follow the Constitution, when in fact they're doing none of that. They're just doing their own things under the guise or color of law. If even, which is, of course, the wording in their fraudulent codes, of which these people hold the copyright. Go figure. If even relatively minor elements of these legislative schemes are shielded from state interference, states a fortiori may not destroy a previously valid federal copyright in its entirety. The supremacy clause implications of respondents' broad theories have not been litigated extensively in the lower courts, only one court of appeals has addressed these arguments, and even then, only in cursory fashion. In BOCA, the First Circuit hastily concluded that there was no preemption problem with the state's abridgment of a copyright in a privately authored work that had been incorporated into state law because such abridgment was consistent with and required by federal law 628F2D at 735. But the First Circuit entirely overlooked 17 U.S.C. 201E, 
or subsection 201E, which expresses Congress's deliberate rejection of the involuntary elimination of individual authors' copyright interests through state action. Mm -hmm -hmm. When an individual author's ownership of a copyright or of any of its exclusive rights under a copyright has not previously been transferred voluntarily by that individual author, no action by any government body or either other official or organization purporting to seize expropriate transfer or exercise rights of ownership with respect to the copyright or any of the exclusive rights under a copyright shall be given effect under the title accepts as provided under Title 11, i.e. the bankruptcy code. Another code of which these people hold a copyright. Uh, the BOCA court thus overlooked a critical provision of the copyright statute. Section 201E explicitly, explicitly rejects BOCA's premise, namely that the federal copyright statute, or at least a judicial gloss upon the Federal Copyright Act 628F.2D at 735, requires the invalidation of the copyright for works incorporated into law. The plain language of subsection 201E proves the contrary state actions purporting, i.e. appearing, to expropriate, i.e. deprive the owner of copyright ownership do not in fact do so under statute 17 USC, that's the United States Code, ha ha ha, subsection 201, CEG Oxford English Dictionary Online, ED 2019, defining purport as appear ostensibly to do, be or do something and defining expropriate as dispossess a person of ownership or deprive of property. Now, what's interesting is that these people that are writing this paper, they would know that it doesn't matter what the Oxford English Dictionary's definition of anything is. What only matters is what the definition of things are used in the legal document that is being cited. So it doesn't matter what the Oxford English Dictionary states a word is in relation to a constitutional word, it only matters what the Constitution defines that word as. And that's the same thing with basically all legal documents. So that's interesting that they are injecting the Oxford English Dictionary's definition as though it has standing to define whatever that word is that they're citing from a previous court case and so on and so forth. Anyway, Section 201E confirms the Supremacy Clause problems that in here and sweeping claims about the law belonging to the people. Ha ha ha, obviously the writer of this thing does not like that wording. As applied to privately authored works incorporated to state or local law, that claim shared by respondent in the 11th Circuit below violates Section 201E and the Supremacy Clause, with so little attention paid to this issue in the lower courts and zero attention paid to it in this case, the court should avoid expressing or implying any view on the question here. Go figure. Respondents' views create expansive takings clause liability. The Constitution also prohibits governmental takings of private property without just compensation. Now, what's interesting is that they would note that one, but they would not note the section that talks about being deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. One wonders why they didn't reference that one. So what they did reference was U.S. Constitutional Amendment 5, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Although the court has not yet held specifically that copyrights are property for takings clause purposes. So that's their takings clause, even though they list it as the takings clause, as if there couldn't possibly be any other parts of the Constitution that prohibit the taking of things. Anyway, there is no reason for doubt. The court has long used the language of property to describe copyrights, describing copyright legislation as creating a literary property of an author in his works. Isn't that interesting right there? So the things that Congress makes, alleged, the alleged Congress anyway, is literary property. Sounds like this person is talking about Fiction theory, which is the basis for the entire fraudulent court system that we have today. Congress's copyright legislation proceeds from the conviction that encouragement of individual effort by personal gain is the best way to advance public welfare 
through the talents of authors. Well, isn't that nice? That is not the Constitution. That's their opinion. Their opinion is that it's good for public welfare. Of course, that would be the juridic public, as always, because they don't like the human public so much. Anyway, and that sacrificial days devoted to such creative activities deserve rewards commensurate with the services rendered. It's a more coded word even for you. The court has squarely held that state law trade secrets are property under the takings clause. Ruckel, Ruckel's House, the Monsanto Company, 467 U.S. 986, 1000 to 1004, 1984. <laughs> 1984. Is that a nice year? Trade secrets are assignable, can be held in trust, passed to trustees in bankruptcy, and are often described as proprietary interests. Now, isn't that an interesting note there? They can be passed to trustees in bankruptcy. One wonders in what context that part is talking about. Perhaps a context that might, in fact, affect this very issue of which they are talking. Now, the best manifestation of these codes can be found, or this weird copyright, copyrighted code law monopoly thing, which is just like, it's possibly the most, the closest you get to, to a strange twilight zone scenario. Well, the most apparent physical manifestation of it comes in the awful building designs that seem homogeneously made to present and project the same appearance, such as with the Los Angeles Police Department building, which is anything but tactical and is all about show, as with most such public uh, government, so-called governmental structures, which the entire purpose is to promote the facade of power or rather domination. This is also apparent with buildings like Los Angeles Hall of Justice and the same similar architecture can be found with the John Hopkins Hospital, as well as with schools and other buildings like the embassies and consulates. Now, obviously, the reach of this International Code Council spans far beyond just the United States. And so we're going to go ahead and look at the National Building Code of India, 2016, Volume 1. This is from 2016, as, as stated in the cover. And it's the third revision. I mean, the second revision in 2005, first revision in 1983, and first published in 1970 from the Bureau of Indian Standards. And there it's listed ICS 01. Point one two zero nine one point zero four zero point zero one, and this was published by the Bureau of Indian Standards. Now, in this document, we get more wording that is akin to the previous court document. There's a lot of convoluted wording, wording, and uh, double speak, or the talked with forked tongue, where they intend one thing but many will look at it and not see the cloaked language and what is actually being admitted to forward construction programs are interwoven in a large measure in all sectors of development be it housing transport industry irrigation power agriculture education or health that interesting so construction programs are interwoven. Whose construction programs, right? And of course, they are in all sectors of development, as we looked at those examples previously. Construction, both public and private, accounts for about 50% of the total outlay of the planned expenditure in the country. Of course, public and private being juridic entities, public, juridic, and private, juridic, not natural human. 
Half of the total money spent on construction activities is spent on buildings for residential, industrial, commercial, administrative, educational, medical, municipal, and entertainment uses. There, go figure. It is estimated that about half of the total outlay on buildings is on housing. It is imperative that for such a large national investment, optimum returns are assured and wastage in construction is avoided. That last sentence could not be more applicable. Optimum returns are insured for a large national investment. What large national investment? Is it an investment that benefits the nation? Or is it an investment in the nation uh, for someone else? It just stipulates that it's large and that it is an investment that may or may not pertain to something national. And of course, that's for optimum returns being assured and wastage in construction to be avoided. Now, what could that wastage be? Maybe design something well built for a, a view of beauty or talent, right? All of that is might be at least wastage, but this is intentionally left vague. That's likely what the perspective of this writer is and of the writer of the codes, but it's not overtly stated in that paragraph. Soon after the third five-year plan, the planning commission decided that the whole gamut of operations involved in construction, such as administrative, organizational, financial, and technical aspects, be studied in depth. For the study, a panel of experts, as always, was appointed in 1965 by the Planning Commission, and its recommendations are found in the Report on Econom Economies and Construction Costs, published in 1968. I wonder who sat on that, quote, Planning Commission, and how many other planning commissions that they might have sat on, and of course, which particular planning commission this one is, of which I imagine there are many planning commissions in India and across the globe. One of the facets of building construction, namely controlling and regulating buildings through municipal bylaws and departmental handbooks, obviously made by the International Code Council, received the attention of the panel and a study of these regulatory practices revealed that some of the prevailing methods of construction were outmoded. Some designs were overburdened with safety factors and there were other design criteria which, in the light of newer techniques and methodologies, could be rationalized. And building bylaws and regulations of municipal bodies, which largely regulate the building activity in the country, wherever they exist, were outdated. They did not cater to the use of new building materials and the latest developments in building design and construction techniques. Now, of course, the latest designs, what most people would imagine when they read this, perhaps, would be cutting edge technology, that sort of wording. Not, of course, what is deemed as latest developments by a centralized body of code developers that gets uh, sent to all corners of the globe and whatever they say is the new design, that's what they're referencing. Not something that's actually new because a lot of this stuff is actually very old and it's recycled from many, many, many centuries ago. It's just repackaged and rebranded as new and the latest. It also became clear that these codes and bylaws lacked uniformity and they were more often than not specification oriented and not performance oriented. Wonder what exactly that orientation of performance is and why that's an issue to have something specification oriented, not performance oriented. And of course, it's oriented in that direction. That wording is akin to the absolute awful wording of that egregious document, the Cardinal Principles on the Reorganization of Secondary Education, which was uh, analyzed by the uh, infamous, in many cases, Richard Mitchell, who talked just about that awful use of 
English in that way that you find replicated across nearly all of these documents, whether it be an educational document, pharmaceutical document, a legal document, they all have that similar framework of wording of how they talk about things being oriented or their little word techniques where they talk about the quote reasonable person things like that anyway these studies resulted in a recommendation that a national building code be prepared to unify the building regulations throughout the country for use by government departments right unify building regulations municipal bodies and other construction agencies the then Indian Standards Institution, now Bureau of Indian Standards, of course, they renamed it. They always do that, sort of constantly moving the puck, so to speak, was entrusted by the Planning Commission with the preparation of the National Building Code. For fulfilling this task, a guiding committee, always with these committees, for the preparation of the code was set up by the Civil Engineering Division Council of the Indian Standards Institution in 1967. This committee in turn set up 18 specialist panels. Of course, of course, you set up a committee and that committee will then go in turn set up other committees and subcommittees and other groups and other play, uh, entities and whatnot. And of course, they had to set up 18 of these specialist panels to prepare the various parts of the code. And I wonder how many of the people that sat on that committee made up the 18 specialist panels as well and received pay from all their made up positions that they created for themselves. Anyway, the guiding committee and its panels were con constituted with architects, planners, materials experts, structural, construction, electrical, illumination, air conditioning, acoustics, and public health engineers and town planners. These experts were drawn from the central and state governments. Yeah, big surprise, right? The people on the committees are drawn from the central and state government, and then the people the experts that they put onto all these ones are drawn from the same place. Big surprise. Anyway, local bodies, professional institutions, and private agencies. Now, I expect those professional institutions will be the usual college professors. The first version of the code was published in 1970. After the National Building Code of India was published in 1970, a vigorous implementation. Yeah. They had to specify that the implementation was vigorous, but it's not just a vigorous implementation, but is a vigorous implementation drive. It's driving to implementation, not actually implementing it. It's driving to implementation vigorously, which was launched by the Indian Standards Institution to propagate the contents and use of the code among all concerned in the field of planning, designing and construction activities. And there you go. This is basically stating what we all know across the globe. Every single building, all of these ugly atrocities, these complexes, these boring, quote, modern designs, they all come from the same source. And that's why they all look the same. And it's designed as uh, listed further or earlier for optimum returns and to avoid wastage. Those could be highlighted and put in gold and stamped across all of these awful constructs, whatever you want to call them, monstrosities, ugly and and uh, optimum for returns and to avoid wastage. <laughs> anyway, for this statewide implementation conference, were organized with the participation of leading engineers, architects, town planners, administrators, building material manufacturers, building and plumbing service installation agencies, contractors, etc. I don't know how many times they can state the same thing that they use people from the various governments to do all of this stuff. To staff all of the things that they created for themselves, basically. These conferences were useful in getting across the contents of the code to the interests concerned. These conferences had also helped the establishment of action committees. Yes, of course, more committees. You just can't ever have enough of them. To look into the actual implementation work carried out by the construction departments, local bodies, and other agencies in different states. So now you have 
a you have oversight committees that have created uh, expert panels and then you have more oversight committees that will look into the oversight committees and whether or not they're overseeing the sub expert panels that they created to <laughs> just do nothing i guess propagate uh, a use of the code the main actions taken by the action committees were to revise and modernize their existing regulatory media such as specifications handbooks manuals etc as well as building bylaws of local bodies like municipalities at city and town levels. Zia Parishads, Panchayats, and development authorities, so as to bring them in line with the provisions contained in the National Building Code of India. And you have to wonder where that code came from. Probably the same one that we have here in the United States from that International Code Council that we referenced earlier. In this process, the Indian Standards Institution rendered considerable support to redrafting process. The National Building Code of India is a single document in which, like a network, the information contained in various Indian standards is woven into a pattern of continu continuity and co cogency with the interdependent requirements of part sections carefully analyzed and fitted in to make the whole document a cogent continuous volume a continuous thread of pre-planning is woven which in itself contributes considerably to the economies in construction particularly in building and plumbing services what a nightmare of convoluted grammar that basically explains nothing except that these people have a monopoly and they're reinforcing this awful standardized or quote modernized construction garbage for the purpose of optimum returns and ensure that wastage is avoided so considering they have a monopoly in which the state itself is the monopoly where it's just all of these glad handing entities that are all run by the same people it is a completely rigged system where where it's sort of like when somebody asks a survey question that doesn't have a right answer on it it's completely rigged basically so this comes from the idea where if you can make enough paperwork about something it creates a facade of a grandiose and large system not only that the codification which you find in all of these awful obtrusive buildings and terrible construction patterns that's not the only level of this code monopoly but you can find it with all of the other kind of paperwork that we we have to uh, adhere to and of course that also applies to the idea of well, how did all of this stuff come to be? Individuals across the world fear, follow, and believe in fictitious or a facade of power. That's what all of this has to do with. It has to do with the facade of many from few, and it has to do with the facade of fearing force, which is not practically there. But not only that, when you follow these people and their suggestions, which is pretty much what they are, it can lead to your own destruction, as we've seen in the past with the eugenics uh, theme, which continues even today in under the name genetic theory or gene theory. Eugenics, of course, being gene. And then there was that event that shall not be named because of obviously rampant censorship by these same people in which you follow their suggestions uh, usually coercively mandated but for your own protection as always well if you actually followed them then you would be 
going to your own destruction, as with all of these building codes and all of this paperwork, which is designed to bind us and control us. Now, this theme was referenced in the Keys to the Kingdom series, which is a fantasy fiction series talking about the idea of trustees misusing their position and uh, in bad faith administering their duties for their own personal benefit. And in one of the books, it was referenced a uh, expansive network of these uh, paper pushing uh, sorcerers, basically. And that's what we see today. We have uh, a lot of minions that go around pushing these paperworks, but they're really just minions. And they don't really know what they're doing. They are simply uh, pawns who are so consumed with promotion and getting one over on their uh, partners that they don't really see what is going on and what they are engaged in and that they are bringing about their own destruction by following these people and their codes. On the subject, we get more perspective in the book Monopolies, Trusts, and Cartels by Francis W. Hurst of the Inner Temple Barrister at Law, late lecturer at the London School of Economics. I guess you couldn't have uh, a person with a more corrupt pedigree than that. So let's go and look at what he has to say about this topic. This was first published in, or published in 1905. This is under uh, part two, chapter two, on page 121, the American Trusts. Under the protectionist policy, which has prevailed in the United States, with some temporary relaxation during the last half century, many branches of industry have been in a greater or less degree monopolized, and the immense profits grant gained or said to have been gained by certain trusts, which have obtained a pretty complete control of particular industries, have made the trust organization enormously popular with capitalists, financiers, and investors. Now, of course, uh, many of us use these words today over through overuse they have lost much of their meaning one of those words is capitalist which simply signifies somebody or a belief system in or, or uh, i suppose a practical system of belief in which the person who provides the most capital to an enterprise is the most important versus the individual who has the most talent or skill to get the job done. Instead, it falls to the individual that has the most quantity of value, whatever that thing might be, to fund the operation. So it's more of like, well, essentially it's the same idea as uh, the wealthier person wins out over the more skilled individual. Well, that's the idea of capitalism anyway. In continuation, but in recent years, it has become the favorite object of popular odium. A strong agitation for antitrust legislation began in the United States about 15 years ago. Now, here's that uh, little word game that's going on there. See, the odium, as always, has been the corrupt people manipulate everything and trying to enslave humanity, working together towards uh, evil ends and uh, practicing uh, essentially anything that is necessary or required, however vile and uh, in, inconscionable or unconscionable to uh, maintain their position of manipulation and things like that. So that's what the odium is for. And then they, the writer pivots that to state that there has been agitation for antitrust legislation. Now, whether that's not true, whether that's true among the uh, so-called masses or the uh, main uh, lay public, as they might call it, or the uh, natural public, you know, the uh, us that they hold contempt for. Well, that doesn't really factor in because the antitrust uh, or the agitation for antitrust legislation is simply meaning 
uh, could mean many different things, actually, but it probably means that you have groups of corporate political propagandists that go out and then talk about this topic a lot, and they're the agitators. So it's simply stating that somebody is going out and agitating for antitrust legislation. So it's a very vague topic that is attempting, because considering the um, previous sentence here, it's trying to insinuate that most in the United States have, believe that legislation against trusts is really going to solve the problem. And it, uh, obviously it wouldn't if the ones that are legislating are in fact themselves in a trust because you can't that that's that's a conundrum you you know you can't pass something that would destroy your own position right that's just um an impossibility because it's it's a if you destroy your own position by doing something to do that then you would need to have had that position to destroy it in the first place so yeah it's it's, it's a conundrum that's uh the, the word for it Anyway, it is said to have been strengthened, if not caused, by the tremendous efforts put forth by the Sugar Trust to enforce monopoly prices by private combination. The Sugar Trust was organized in October 1887, flourished in 1888 through 89, and began to decline owing to competition, litigation, and public indignation in 1890. Now, the litigation likely had nothing to do with it, and the public indignation, indignation likely didn't have anything to do with it. The competition is the most likely thing that happened, and that can come in many forms. And here at the bottom, we have that note from one. In an important American sugar trust case, it was pleaded on behalf of the trust that from the nature of sugar, complete control, blah, blah, blah. Uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> to the next page. So this is on 124. And it states, in the price of refined oil was 10 to 4. Between 1873 and 1881, it was 7 to 3. Well, actually, that paragraph, um, well, it, it's not exactly important for what we're looking at. Just talking about the variation in oil price uh, in relation to the trust uh, standard oil trust uh, and then it goes on to say the envelope trust oh which is interesting actually to note that basically all of these trusts came about during the or after the very auspicious year of 1871 and considering the amount of effort that goes into subverting that particular date and what happened then i won't go over it <clears throat> that is definitely a horse that's been beat to death. But it's interesting that the rise of these uh, trusts, uh, openly at least, come about after 1871. But there is much to argue about the um, viewpoint that the Constitution itself actually forms a trust system. It's like That's basically what it is, at least according to the definition that we'll read here. Anyway, the envelope trust deserves honorable mention for its extreme ingenuity. It paid one manufacturer of a patented machine a fixed sum to manufacture exclusively for the envelope trust. In this way, a private artificial monopoly based upon a voluntary contract in restraint of trade distance, or rather evaded all competition except in the one item of stamped envelopes. There, the government of the United States was protected against competition by another artificial monopoly based upon statute. Let us turn our attention to some of the startling mushroom growths of the last few years. It has been found by the great financial houses, which live largely on flotation, that giant combinations, especially during financial booms, are very attractive to investors. And enormous sums have been poured into vast top-heavy concerns like the shipping trust that were plainly destined to end in disaster. The eminent economist and statistician, Mr. Schloss, in the important memorandum which he prepared last year for the Board of Trade, defines a trust for the purpose of this, his inquiry. As any organization pursuing a common business policy on a scale sufficient, sufficiently large to control wholly or partially the course of trade. So there is 
your definition of a trust, it is an organization which is pursuing a common business policy on a scale sufficient, sufficiently large to control wholly or partially the course of trade. You could argue, in many ways, according to the articles in the Constitution, that that is exactly what the document is attempting to do, except the difference would be that most of these trusts that are listed here are looking to make a profit, as are most of our alleged governmental organizations today. Their actions alone show that their interests are for profit and to control for the benefit of the members within it the uh, trade, to restrict trade. Whereas the Constitution would restrict trade for the benefit of all in relation to the Constitution. There wouldn't a actually, none of the individuals in the Constitution are supposed to benefit. They're simply supposed to carry out a, a duty or responsibility to their neighbors, right? It's, it's a position of responsibility, like being in the military. Nobody should ever join the military for benefits. Just like no one should ever join up to be a executive or judicial officer as the Constitution stipulates for the benefit of doing so. It is simply a duty and responsibility of something that affects all. And if nobody does it, as we see today, then we have the awful, oppressive corporate trust monopoly that calls itself, itself government. That's what we have today. But according to that definition of a organization that follows a common business policy for the uh, for the restriction of trade, well, that, that there is a clause in the Constitution specifically about restricting trade, and that has to do with Congress stipulating ways and measures and things like that. But it is not supposed to be for personal gain, like it is today. Anyway, in continuation, perhaps we had, a, had better say of domestic prices in the classes of goods produced or distributed. Now, another word for that is Keynesian economics, which is the idea of scarcity and that only certain areas can produce things and those areas have to trade with others that produce something else. And then everybody better monetizes their output of products. There is a gridlock control that ensures trade only happens between of certain things only happens between certain places right that's exactly what's being described here the keynesian economics that they teach in school is literally teaching how to operate within this trust and that there are no other alternatives anyway now to the student who pursues his vocation Without paying much attention to the hidden motives of political journalism, it may seem surprising that in the United States there should be an outcry against the trusts because they sell dear, while in England there is an outcry against those same trusts because they sell cheap. But the explanation is simple. In America, it is the whale of the consumer whose prices are raised by monopoly. In England, it is the whale of the producer whose prices are lowered by competition. It should also be remembered to guard ourselves against exaggeration that only a small fraction of the exports of the United States are manufactured and partly manufactured goods. The great bulk, uh, I think that might be redundant, anyway, still consists of agricultural produce and of this fraction, only a small fraction is dumped. This, is, this much is certain. Let me quote the words of Mr. Schloss. The available evidence goes to show that for some time past, the United States has for the most part been able to absorb and has in fact kept at home a great poor portion of its total output of manufactured goods and that during this period of exceptionally good trade in the American home market, the inducement on the part of the trust organization of the... Well, actually, that's where our tale will end about this particular topic from this particular book. So one thing that this book does help us clarify, despite all of the uh, word games that are being played here, just as with previous documents, is it defines simply the idea of institutions which seek to control everything in a way that benefits specifically them and no one else. And that is exactly what is behind this code mechanism. 
This code mechanism that we see throughout all of the corporate governments is exactly what is being explained here. It is what the Standard Oil Trust did. It's what the Sugar Trust did. It's what all these other groups did where they everything that they did was to the detriment of others but for the benefit of themselves. And when it comes to these codes, they are all written to the benefit of the code writers, the private entity that holds the copyrights to them, to the detriment of everyone else. Because it is a company and it is carrying out its own business interests, just like the trusts that are described here. Now we find evidence of this topic all over the place with mentions of this type of thing, such as with the Board of Trustees and their bylaws, or the Ritter Public Library in the city of Vermilion, Ohio. Here we find it listed that members of the Ritter Public Library Board of Trustees are as provided for in the Ohio Revised Code, again that code, right, 3375.15, and that does not reference the International Code Council, so perhaps that's copyright infringement. Anyway, appointed by the Vermilion Board of Education for a term of seven years, unexpired terms shall be filed by the Board of Education. An oath of office is administered to each member of the board upon appointment or reappointment. Members of the board serve without compensation. So <clears throat> we're going to dissect that. The vague oath of office is a nod to the part of the Constitution that calls for uh, oaths uh, or the swearing of executive and judicial officers. But this one is likely not that and has to do with an oath to uphold the terms of these bylaws and whatever else things that they're stipulated. And it is very interesting that the Board of Trustees are appointed by the Board of Education. See, the only individuals that could appoint a Board of Trustees would be the beneficiary or grantor of a trust, logically speaking. And so either the Board of Education are the grantors or beneficiaries, or they could possibly be trustees of a different trust, and they're uh, electing other trustees to act on their behalf in some sort of capacity. And whether or not that is acting outside of their authority as trustees of the trust, whatever that may be, would entirely depend on the terms of that. And the only people that could find out the terms of a trust would be the beneficiary or grantor. And I suppose in many cases, if you want to find out whether or not you're a beneficiary of any of these trusts, all you have to do is ask for the trust documents. And if they laugh in your face, then you know that you are not the beneficiary. So let's go ahead and briefly look at what a trustee is. A trustee is a person, according to trustedwill.com, who acts as a custodian for the assets held within a trust. He or she is responsible for managing and administering the finances of a trust per the instructions given. Often, the person who creates the trust is the trustee until they can no longer fill the role due to incapacitation or death. So that's not technically true. Tor normally, a trustee would be somebody who acts on somebody else's behalf and, and are appointed to essentially administer the, the trust, right? And that's sort of what it says. But it also states that the person who creates the trust is a trustee, but person who creates the trust would be the grantor, generally. Or it could possibly be uh, a different position, but the trustee is not really the one that's supposed to take, uh, create the trust anyway. So that could be an obfuscation of the term, <clears throat> which happens quite a lot in different circles, so it, the topic becomes confused, where somebody so if you take legal documents, for instance, every legal document has its own definition of something, and it is a definition of that thing within the document that matters, not what somebody else's definition. So that's why it was weird when we saw the International Code Council referencing Merriam or uh, was it Webster's, Webster's Dictionary or whatever it was. No, it was the Oxford Dictionary. Yeah, they're referencing the Oxford Dictionary. Uh, but that doesn't matter because the Oxford Dictionary was not a party in the legal document that was being quoted. And that's sort of the same thing here is that you could have the concept of what a trustee is and then you could have an entity come along 
and assign a different definition to the word trustee. And that is how the waters get muddied, so to speak. According to U.S. Bank, a trustee of a trust is a legally is legally responsible to manage the trust in accordance with the terms of the trust document. A trustee can be an individual, a corporate trustee, or a combination of both. It's important to explore different scenarios before making a decision. Yes, so you don't have to be an individual to be a trustee. You can actually be a, a trust could actually ask, act as a trustee for another trust. So that doesn't get confusing. Uh, according to U.S. Bank again, your trustee, co-trustee, or corporate trustee, if you select a financial institution as your trustee, you also have the option to appoint a co-trustee, which could be a friend or family member, and potential for charitable giving. Consider whether you'd like to make charitable da da da. Well, that's uh, a bunch of hogwash with the charitable donations propaganda. Now, in the business relationships under the Michigan Trust Code article by the Michigan Bar Journal, we get find a very interesting passage talking about a section of the Michigan Code, which again comes from the International Code Council and is copyrighted material for private business interests. Now, that interesting section is titled Reliance. In order for a business to deal with trustees, generally, a third party can rely on a trustee's representations. <laughs> generally. Paraphrasing only slightly, MCL, that's uh, Michigan Code, not sure what the L stands for. Anyway, 707.7912.1 provides that a person who in good faith assists the trustee or who in good faith and for value deals with the trustee without knowledge that the trustee's action exceeds the trustee's authority or that there exists an improper exercise of the trustee's powers under the trust will be protected from liability as if the trustee had properly exercised those powers. So that's interesting that they would write that into the code because what that is referencing is the idea of mens rea or state of mind. Somebody who is not of the state of mind to commit a crime cannot commit that crime. But when they become aware that they are in fact doing that, then it becomes willful and knowledgeable or willful behavior with knowledge. Then you have crime. So this is talking about that concept in a very twisted way and the reason why that is going on is because you have a large number of trustees today, especially when it comes to the trustees in the quote public sector, sector or the governmental sector, which are outside of their authority. They're acting of their own volition and therefore they are in bad faith misexecuting what they're supposed to do. But when they get somebody else to do it for them, well, you can't get that some hold the other other person accountable because they don't know what they're doing is wrong. And that's what they're talking about here, which is the state of mind. If you have an ignorance cat's paw, do all the dirty deeds, then it's less likely you'll get caught. Right. And that's what's going on here. You have a lot of trustees that are not doing what they're supposed to, according to the trust document. And in order to find out that they're outside of their realm of authority, one has to be a beneficiary or some, in some way a party involved with the trust, but you also have to know how to get the document. And then if you think about it, if you have a trustee who is acting outside of their authority and you demand the trust document from them, it's very unlikely they're gonna deliver it up to you. So even if you, even if like say the United States Constitution formed a trust and we're the beneficiaries of that trust, well, the individuals that are acting under the color of law today are not the trustees for that document. So even if you ask them for the information, they might still laugh in your face, not because there is it, not because you're not a beneficiary and it's not there, but because they themselves are not going to provide it to you one way or the other. Either they're trustees acting outside of their authority and haven't have gone the proverbial rogue, or they're not even a trustee and they have nothing to do with it. They're just pretending like they're the administers when they're really not. 
So we find similar themes of this concept throughout literature and different spheres, just like with the character Grima Wormtongue in uh, Lord of the Rings, where all of his authority and position is derived from somebody else and through the facade or the uh, appearance of power rather than the actual having of power. So it is simply people's fear of something that's fake that gets that or coerces them into action rather than somebody who has the actual tangible force and ability to make sure what their uh, will is done. This is just like in recent uh, literature, we find this idea where you have people who are following along with uh, fear mongering and uh, all kinds of fake force, the, the image of power to coerce people to do things when it is all really a facade. And the only thing that will cause uh, an individual damage will be following such mandates that are simply based off of a appearance of force, right? It's the appearance of force, which is the reason why all of these buildings look the way they do. They are attempting to impose the visage of force without actually having the practical um, coercive element behind it, right? The ability, the skill, the knowledge, the expertise, that's not there. It's all about the appearance of it, not the actual acquisition and use. Of course, once you follow along with somebody's ill-guided advice that automatically leads to your destruction, that same individual will always point the finger somewhere else. And this is something we can find um, with the uh, recent propaganda, where the individuals who were not following certain mandates were blamed as the cause for various issues and problems that might have come from somewhere else. Now you find this same theme in the Bible, where the uh, part where the Pharaoh and the people of Egypt, they're following along, logically speaking, with a bad advice, which leads them down a road of destruction. And then they blame this on someone else, obviously, who had absolutely nothing to do with their own bad decisions. And in, in that, we also find the theme of the death of children, or which is, of course, uh, something we find today through the gene theory uh, analysis, which, of course, is uh, derived from eugenics. And that pattern we also find with the dying children in ancient Egypt. And we can also find that theme replicated in the Spartan culture when they would sacrifice children, the ineffective or the sickly children, which then filters into the 20th century eugenics propaganda, just like with these newspaper examples we find here, talking about the fitter... Uh, humans that will be found through uh, forced sterilizations of uh, children that are undesir undesirable or simply uh, executed through abortions or through uh, elimination, um, those types of things, right? You, you're going to make everyone stronger through killing the weak. That's the idea. And, of course, that is the theme that's replicated in the modern gene theory, considering that these names only slightly change, but they're all still the same thing. And the theme and pattern of following along with bad advice that leads to your own destruction and then blaming it on somebody else is something that's present throughout these concepts, where, a, as we can see here, we have the mutated gene, right? So somebody who is not born right is not born right because they have a mutated gene. All part of eugenics theory, which is similar to the Spartan elimination of uh, weak children. And then, of course, we can find replicated in the death of the Egyptian children 
And it's not necessarily like it says in the highly edited Bible that the quote spirit of the of of the Holy Ghost or whatever when it killed them. It, it's more than likely that they were following bad advice as many do today, which ended up with the deaths of their children through poisoning and sickness and lack of uh, common sense or lack of uh, practical application or sense, you know, like uh, people that are intentionally making their children sickly by following bad advice, thinking that it's going to benefit them, and then believing this stuff that we find today about genes and eugenics and all this other stuff that gets proved to be uh, vindictive, evil, and um, have ulterior motives for the destruction of others. And yet it simply takes on another form and continues marching on through the imposition of these corrupt tyrants that control everything through their code enforcement mechanisms uh, for the, you know, their private uh, copyrighted material. And through all of the cronies and uh, minions that carry out their interests against, in many ways, the, their own interests as minions, right? Most of the minions that carry out the stuff, they don't understand that they are they're go, they are the swine going to their own destruction, right? You know, they're the uh, people who are willing participants in their own death, essentially. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please check out my other content. There are free books available at the link. And if you so desire, you may support my work at PayPal or Cash App. <laughs>